Are you considering converting your bike to electric? If so, this video is for you. I'm gonna give you five things to consider before you get into the project. Let's get into it. So the very first question before converting you wanna ask yourself is the purpose of converting. A lot of the customers that we have convert because they're either getting older and they need some assist so they can still go out and ride and enjoy the bike. Some customers wanna commute, some customers wanna just go trail riding and going uphill is a nightmare. So yeah, so the, that's the first question you wanna ask yourself is what the purpose is and then you buy your frame accordingly. So you can pretty much convert any bike to electric but these five things that I'm about to tell you are going to help you save time, money, some gray hair, uh, and it'll make your conversion go a lot smoother. So the first thing you want to look at when selecting a bike or a donor frame for your conversion is going to be the frame of the bike. Uh, depending on what kind of build you're doing, if you're doing a gravel bike or a mountain bike or a trike or tadpole, there, there's a load of different types of frames that you can get. The first thing you want to look at if it's an aluminum frame or a steel frame. Generally speaking, aluminum frames and steel frames is what you want to go with for conversions because they're sturdy and they're just built better for conversions. There's carbon fiber bikes out there. They're much lighter, but the frame is very rigid. I would say stay away from them, but we have had a lot of customers do carbon fiber bikes on mid-drive kits, which I'll explain later and they've done it very successfully, but there is a chance that you may damage the frame because of the high torque. So on your donor bike, just make sure there's no cracks or rust on the frame, They're, the wheels are straight, you know, it's a good, healthy bike. You don't want something that's gonna fall apart on you because there's a lot of torque coming out and you know, you just snap off something, you know? So you just wanna make sure it's a sturdy, sturdy bike. Another thing in the frame that you want to look at is the spacing of everything. So this is a fully converted bike. You want to make sure the triangle has enough room for the battery or if it does not, then you got to make sure you can mount like a rack on the back and put the mount, mount the battery on there. So you can mount, there's like rectangular pack batteries that you can mount on there. You can even mount these batteries on the rear rack. So there's a wide variety of battery shapes and sizes that you can mount on there. Another thing you want to look at if it's a hardtail or a full suspension bike. Generally speaking, with hardtail bikes, they're much easier to convert like this one. You could just fit, throw a battery in there and you're good to go. But with full suspensions, depending on where the shock is, it's going to be hard for you to find a battery that actually fits inside the triangle. So maybe you go with the rear rack or there's other different kind of, kinds of batteries that kind of mount under the seat or like a backpack battery but I'm not a big fan of those just because they don't give you a lot of range and they're like smaller packs. This one is a 52 volt, 17 and a half amp hour battery and it can give you on a moderate assist, it can give you like 40 miles, which is a lot for of riding. Other than that, there are some bikes that have maybe, that have, have like one of those like standing shocks or one of the shocks up there and you can put like a slim shark pack in there. So there are bikes that, like full suspension bikes that can accommodate a full size battery but it's hard to do and it's hard to find. It's hard to fit it in there because you need, uh, just aside from this, you need like an extra centimeter or, or two of clearance just to slide it into the rack. Another option for full suspension bikes is a custom made battery. There's vendors out there that do make custom batteries. We've also done custom batteries. I'll put a picture up of one of the bikes that we did, or actually I'll put a whole build so you can see how we did, we fit full battery with the shock in there. And if you do decide to go with the full suspension or if your frame is different and it doesn't have enough space in the triangle, you can always mount it here. The only problem here is if once you get off the seat, it, you know, the battery's right where you don't want it to be and it's a little bit uncomfortable. Or you can mount it down here if you have enough space and if you have clearance from the tire when the shock is fully depressed. So generally, the, these kind of batteries will mount into the water bottle holes, but we do have other adapters that can help you mount them anywhere. It could basically, it's a universal mount and it can mount on anywhere, on any kind of tube. And if you're having a hard time figuring out, figuring out what battery to use and you know even what motor to use, you can always give us a call. We offer a free consultation over the phone. I think we're the only ones that actually pick up a phone call and not charge for it. If you're stuck and you don't know what to do, feel free to give us a call. That leads me to my next step is number two, which is deciding which motor to get. So there's two major type of electric bike conversion kits, the mid-drive kit and the hub kit. 
So the hub kit is basically a motorized wheel that you just replace your regular wheel with. And this one, you know, like the front wheel's missing, you would just put a motorized wheel in there and then mount your peripherals, controller, battery, and you have a fully functioning e-bike. This wheel's a little bit special because it has a built-in controller, so you don't have to plan out mounting a controller. If you're buying a kit from somewhere else, you would have to plan out where to mount the controller. So if you're mounting a battery here, you can mount the controller here or here or in a saddle under the seat. Um, but that's just one more thing that you have to plan out. This one's a very clean kit. This also comes in a front hub or a rear a conversion kit. If you wanna know the details and the pros and cons of each one, I did a video a few years ago about one, so I'm gonna link that up on the right corner of the screen. So the hub kits are generally the easiest of installs. They're also one of the most affordable ways to convert your bike to electric. They're great for like commuters or casual riders. They're just looking for an extra boost. A couple things to look out for when you're actually looking to convert it. You have to know the drop off size, which is the in, inside of here to here, which is the width. Uh, generally on bikes like these, it's gonna be 100 millimeters. So that's usually what the front size is on these bikes, on these kits, sorry. And on the rear, it's 135 millimeters. Obviously there is exceptions when it's a fat bike. The front fat bike ones are 135 millimeters wide and the rear ones are either 175 or 195 width in the rear. And another thing to look out for is if you go with the hub kit conversion, definitely, definitely, definitely get one if not two torque arms for each conversion kit. Uh, torque arms are basically metal pieces that hold uh, on the axle and uh, they go on your fork or your dropout in the back and basically prevent from the motor because the motor has a lot of torque on the axle, right? So when you power it up, if it's not holding, your axle is gonna spin and it's gonna spin out of the fork. Trust me, I've done this with experience. I didn't have the torque arm properly mounted. Now this was, I think, one of my first, first, first builds. I didn't have it properly mounted, the torque arm, and it slipped out and basically the wheel flew out and the bike flipped on myself and that was very painful. So to prevent that, definitely go with one, if not two torque arms. Another thing to look out for if you're going with the rear hub conversion kit, then you need to know if you have a cassette in the back or a freewheel in the back. There's some kits that come with, as you can see, the freewheel would have like some threads on it where you mount the freewheel and then thread it on there. But this is the cassette version. So just know what you have, or if you don't know, then just, you know, if you're getting a freewheel, then get a freewheel with it. Or if you're getting a cassette, buy another cassette if you wanna swap it out. On to the mid drives. Mid drives are a beautiful thing. So mid drives are basically mount on, on your bottom bracket. This is your exposable bottom bracket. I did a video on this, how to measure your bottom bracket for your conversion. And I'll go ahead and link that up there. Basically your motor is gonna mount here and then there's some cranks on both sides and the motor uses your drive sh uh, drive train to power the back wheel. So for mountain biking and more serious riders, mid drive is a better way to go as it feels the most natural uh, while riding. It just feels like you have a bionic leg and you know, you pedal and it just goes. A couple things to look out for are if you, you have to know the width of your bottom bracket and also the inner diameter of the tube. Obviously, if there, there's, there's like a lot of different sizes and shapes of bottom brackets come in. This is designed for a BSA threaded 68 to 73 millimeter bottom bracket. But if you have something that's larger in diameter or width for like, for example, fat bikes is going to have like 100 or 120 millimeter bottom bracket. There's kits for that sizes and there's also adapters for sizes if you're, if you either have a press fit or if you have like for example a 54 51 millimeter inner diameter there's adapters that you can use those adapters to convert it down to a 34 millimeter diameter another, th another thing you need to look out for is the clearance of your bike because the motor is going to come here and it, it could potentially hang lower than what you anticipate because of either the routing channel or if you have like hydraulic brakes in there. So you just have to look out for all those things and kind of design it that way. In this bike, we had a Bafang mounted, a BBSHD mounted on there and it was hanging too low. So we kind of scraped off the aluminum here and we were able to get it up. But this is this will definitely void your warranty if it's a new bike. So you wanna be careful doing things like this. So the third thing you wanna look at is the drivetrain. You wanna make sure your bike has a solid drivetrain. It doesn't matter as much on if you're doing a hub conversion kit, but it still does matter. If you're doing a rear hub conversion kit, you wanna make sure your seven or eight speeds, if with the freewheel and with the cassette, you could go with a, up to a 10 speed 
on the cassette, but 11 or 12 speed is gonna be very hard to actually fit into with the hub kit. For the mid drives, drivetrain is everything. So you have to make sure your drivetrain is solid, your chain, I would upgrade to a KMC e-bike chain, which are super strong and they're made for the torque that the mid drive will put out. Generally, a normal bike will put out anywhere from 150 watts of power to 250 watts of power, but hub, uh, sorry, a mid-drive kit like this will put out 1,500 watts of power. So you have to make sure it's it's equipped. Your bike is equipped enough to do that, because the last thing you want is be on the trail and your bike chain snaps, and then your whole day is ruined. So this is where knowing what you're building the bike for will come into play. For example, if you're riding for like hill climbing and you know mountain biking, then you want to have a smaller chainring in the front because it will give you the most torque and lo uh, less top speed. But if you're riding to just ride on the streets and you're looking for like to go as fast as possible, then you want to have the highest chain ring in the front. One thing to look out for is internal hub, uh, internal hub gears, right? You can use them. We have had a lot of customers that have used them, but it just complicates it more if something goes wrong. So ideal is seven to 10 speed cassette or freewheel. That way your chain line is straight with 11 or 12 speed. Like my personal bike has a 12 speed and I have a perfect chain line, um, but it just complicates it a little bit. There are, so if you go with, for example, a Bafang hub kit or Bafang mid drive kit, there are Lecky chain rings that can accommodate 11 or 12 speed and have a correct chain line because it'll have a deeper offset. Offset meaning chain ring will go over the motor head and it'll give you a deeper offset and have a correct chain line. With the regular chain rings, and if you have 11, 12 speed in the back, it won't give you a correct chain line. Your chain line's gonna be somewhere in you know the eighth or ninth gear. All right, number four is brakes. Brakes are crucial, 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 crucial. For safety, you wanna go with hydraulic brakes or mechanical brakes, but rotors. If you have V brakes, they have the least amount of stopping power, but if, if, if that's your only choice, then definitely upgrade the brake pads and make sure they are properly calibrated and everything is proper because the e-bikes are much faster and much heavier. So you need a lot of stopping power to operate them safely. All right, so another thing to keep in mind is if you're gonna be using a hub kit, something like that, which has regen braking in it, uh, change the brake levers that come with the kit and attach it to the wire harness and when you press the brake lever it, the motor will help you stop so it's a great supplement to if you're using like rim brakes or something like that which will actually make it a lot safer with the geared hubs and mid-drive kits there are uh, adapt there are sensors that you can put on for brakes which also make it safer so you know if you're pedaling and braking at the same time you can burn out the motor or the controller or something so with those sensors if once you, it activates their magnetic sensors so once you activate them it'll cut power to the motor so they do help you keep you safe step number five it's the electrical layout so before you get into the build you want to make sure that you have a plan for where you're gonna wire everything and how everything's gonna go. If you have enough, so if, for example, if you're doing a tandem bike or a tandem trike or a tadpole trike, you have enough extensions for all the wires that you need. Another thing to look out for is if you have enough extension for all the wires up here, so you have full range of motion. Generally with like mountain bikes and like two-wheeled um, bikes, everything's gonna be good to go just out of the box because they're designed for kits like for bikes like this but if you have something that's odd shaped then you'll need extension cables but generally just have an idea of how you're gonna route it and how you're gonna mount the battery just make sure you're not routing the cables over the motor so just in case you hit something you don't want to chop the wire uh, make sure the speed sensor is also out of the way so everything is nice and tucked in and it doesn't interfere with your riding so to convert your bike from a normal bike to an electric bike can look like a daunting task but in actuality it's actually pretty simple it can be done in a weekend or over three to four hours and if you're experienced you could do it over one to two hours either way that wraps up today's video if you have any questions leave them in the comments below and we'll see you guys in the next one